You have a responsibility to tell the truth about what's going on here. I was hired to find out what's going on. No, no, you were hired by us. Is he a liability? Yeah, he's the problem. We destroyed their past, but you're destroying their future. Hey, everybody. Tom Barnes. Stories from the 78 and something that was in the news in 2016. A massive story about the pipeline being built through the Standing Rock Indian Reservation is now on the big screen. The movie's called On Sacred Ground. I'm here with one of the directors. This is Josh uh, Tekel. Did I get that right, Josh? You got it. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah, sure. And Josh, you, uh, you and your wife, Rebecca, did a movie on Netflix that people might know that was called Kiss the Ground. You guys started this project and now it's come to fruition where it's going to hit on-demand streaming and movie theaters here on Friday the 13th. So that's got to be exciting. It is. It's, uh, you know, this is our first scripted feature, big experiment for us. And obviously it's a sensitive topic. It's a topic that, however, it's a topic that touched millions of people's lives, whether they went or whether they were watching the videos on Facebook um, and, or whether they're connected to an indigenous community or part of an indigenous community. This was a touchstone event in American history that was largely underrepresented in the media, um, but it touched a chord, it touched a nerve with people who are tuned in to environmental issues, to indigenous issues, uh, and, and to sort of this modern battle that we have between doing what we think we have to do as a society, grow for oil, capitalism, you know, consume, do all that stuff, you know, and, and, and what we, uh, our values are, what is our morality? And, th and that interplay really played out at Standing Rock. And that's the, that's the background for this film. Yeah, I mean, you have an amazing cast. Amy Smart is in it. David Arquette is in it, among others. Amazing cast. And from the parts that I've seen, I've not seen all of it, but I've seen little snippets here and there. It's unbelievably compelling, obviously for obvious reasons. But I think even more so what you said earlier, how it's, it's kind of sadly the history of how we've done things in this country, especially to the native folks that have been here prior to this country being a country. It happened in like Louisiana years and years ago. And I think that has brought to fruition this new sense of urgency of like, why do we keep doing this? There's gotta be a better way to do what we're doing in terms of oil, the dependency and the way we treat people. Well, we've always made kind of grassroots films and On Sacred Ground continues in that tradition for us as a studio big picture ranch. It is a spiritual film. Um, it is an environmental film. It, it is a film that deals so uh, delicately with this indigenous rights set of issues. Sure. And, and in a way, this is a film that is taking off with the grassroots, you know, we had uh, Lakota tribal leaders and the young people, you know, Standing Rock, people don't realize, it was really started by a group of young activists. And these young activists were people who did uh, these major runs across the country. And they were, they were running for tribal sovereignty, they were running for peace, they were running for the big issues that that community faces, including uh, this terrible issue of missing and murdered indigenous people. They call it missing and murdered indigenous women and men, um, where these big oil camps come in and all of a sudden members of the tribal community will go missing and they'll be found murdered. It's a right. horrible thing. It's happened over and over again. So, you know, that those young people really gave rise to Sandy Rock. The tribal elders, the young people, all were part of formulating this film. And many of the scenes are taken word for word from, from camera audio recordings, from things that happened at Standing Rock. We literally transcribed you know, the documentary camera footage. And then we went and built a scene with two characters doing the exact same thing. And so we had this Lakota community involved in the film from the start. And when you look at like who's picking up the film, how is it spreading? It's being shown on the reservations. It's being shown at Standing Rock. 
It's being shown in over a thousand schools already across the country. And yes, we're releasing it in theaters and yes, in traditional iTunes and Apple TV and Google and Amazon, all those good places that people know how to get films. But where you know when a grassroots film is happening is if the grassroots community that it was involved in making the film is picking it up. And that's that's the, some of the most powerful, amazing screenings that we've had, the film, film festivals. I mean, we've had panels uh, largely of indigenous people with Rebecca and myself. And I mean, people break down crying in the audience, people break down in the panel, because these issues are not issues of four or five years ago. They're issues that these people are facing today. Right, and they have been facing for years and years. It reminds me of a book called Killers of the Flower Moon, which has a lot of what you're, we're talking about now that happened you know, at the turn of the century when America found oil in Louisiana. And it was you know, these indigenous tribes that all of a sudden people were being murdered and missing. Like it's history repeating itself. And you had this wonderful film to shine a light on this story because it's, it's a compelling story. It's a true story that happened. The, the film is based on that. Uh, and you talked about how it struck a chord with the indigenous folks. And I imagine that's really rewarding to know that your work is not falling on deaf ears. And, you know, at least for those people who were seeing it, it makes a world of a difference. Yeah, look, I was fortunate enough to go to Standing Rock and to be there with a camera. Um, you know, our studio organized a bunch of hard drives. That was our donation to the filmmaking community out there. We, we realized that footage was being lost and these were, they were documenting crimes, you know, against the indigenous people. And, and so we were able to get some hard drive companies together to put those hard drives together. I took them out there. I volunteered as a camera person, donated that footage. Uh, and all of that became used by the indigenous community. But in that process, I was welcomed into a group of people, you know, self-admittedly, I did not know that much about truly uh, what life is like in the Lakota tribal nation. We had been talking to Lakota elders for a number of years, and they had been teaching us about the prophecy of the black snake. And they said, listen, there's this prophecy that when the black snake crosses the land, a time of great troubles will begin, quote unquote, right? Hmm. And so then there was the Keystone XL pipeline. And then right after that, you know, in a matter of history, a small period of time elapsed. And then there was this pipeline. And they said, look, this is the black snake. This is it. And so I was overwhelmed with how I was welcomed into that community as a non-Indigenous person, as sure. a person of European descent, as a journalist, you know, uh, we don't have the best reputation for covering Indigenous issues, honestly. Sure. Yeah. Um, the journalistic community is kind of like, what, Indigenous? And moving on. <laughs> Next sure. subject, uh, what's Miley Cyrus doing today? Nothing against Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Love Miley Cyrus, I hear you, but... but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we, often, we often look for sensationalism as a community. And so I was allowed into their world and they showed me what that conflict was really about for them. And they brought me in in such a way that uh, when I returned from Standing Rock and Rebecca was a huge part of this, she was nine months pregnant. She was the one who wanted to go. She was like, I can't go, you go. And, you know, so I went. Um, what they showed me of their world was so different than what I had perceived from the outside. And I think this was true for a lot of water keepers, whether they were indigenous or non-indigenous. It was an event from which people could not recover or did not get over or has stayed with them. And when we got the opportunity finally to make our first narrative film, we said, well, we want to make uh, the most difficult film possible in the dead of winter about oh, a subject sure. that's very, you know, it's riddled with conflict, uh, with a low budget, with a, you know, small film crew. <laughs> uh, and we basically, we, we put all, everything we could uh, into this film because we knew that this coming together of these tribes was an historic experience, you know, 
there's 500, there's over 575 federally recognized tribes in the US. And most people don't know. 575 registered tribes? I thought there were like three or four. Yeah, that's a ton. Yeah. Those are the ones that the federal government recognizes. Then there's a bunch that the government doesn't even, they're like, nah, you're not a tribe. That didn't happen. Um, all of them came together. And it was the first time ever in recorded wow. history that's happened. And not to mention the major indigenous people from around the world, from everywhere from Papua New Guinea, you know, through the island nations, from Asia, from Africa. I mean, this was a truly global moment. And this was a city. It had a school. It had a functioning food system. Um, and, and every day was a series of prayers and lectures and sharings of what all these different groups of people were dealing with around the world. And, and to experience that and, and, and from their perspective, not only was that sacred burial ground, that area, but that is sacred ground. It was a prayer circle. It was a prayer ceremony. So to be in that environment and to be allowed even to set foot in that, I just thought that was that was a remarkable moment in, in oh, yeah. everyone's lives, you know? I bet just to be a part of that and see that from your their perspective, um, that's an honor really to be let into something like that, especially given the the way the world has gone, right? And to see that uh, played out through their eyes, not through somebody perhaps that looks like us telling that story, but through their eyes, through their words, through their visions, and to see it on the screen, I think is huge because I think the United States has a, a reputation of telling stories through a certain lens sometimes, right? No pun intended. Um, but of how things are according to how so so and so sees it versus let's hear what the pe how they reacted to it. I mean, Black Wall Street is a whole other example, but it's how we as a country remember and how people who were there and the descendants of those people are demanding that we remember it now. And I think there's a lot of correlations there. And I, you know, I imagine the cast was super involved with making this just right. I mean, you have some phenomenal actors in there then a little bit of pressure because it is such a hot topic and, and it's resonated well with people because obviously uh, the grassroots campaign of uh, spreading in schools and whatnot has shown that to be successful. Yeah, we had an incredible cast and uh, the names that people do know are, you know, the David Arquette and Mariel Hemingway, Amy Smart, Francis Fisher. Um, the names that are less known had massive influence over the script. So David Midthunder, who's Lakota, and Carrie Knupe, who uh, grew up on Pine Ridge. She is also Lakota. Um, and Che Jim, who is, you know, part of the Diné Nation. These incredible people, we would be on set and getting ready to shoot a scene. I'd be like reading their sides and I'd be like, hey, it's your film totally want to support no matter what, but just so you know, we wouldn't do it this way and we wouldn't say that. And, you know, and it was like, whoa, okay, really? What would you do? We rewrote, right. we, rewrote, <laughs> we rewrote the majority of the film on set because even though it was taken from transcripts, you're still moving people in a 360 degree space. They're interacting with each other and it's like, oh, right. Okay. Like, I didn't realize, I was educated on one of the days, um, we don't point. That's what wow. one of the CODA actors taught me. We don't point as a people. You don't point. No. Oh my gosh. Well, how are you going to show the other yeah. character where to go? Because this is, this is a scene in which, you know, this is a scene in which one character is pointing to show the other character where to walk. Sure. Um, and, and I go, well, how would you how would you let somebody know like it's over there? And he goes like that. Oh. He's like, oh, okay, cool. Okay, so you play, you do the scene. He rewrote the scene and then it, it, and when you watch it, you're like, man, that's so many little subtle moments in the film are like that. And most audiences will never even pick it up. And that's fine. 
but what the audiences that do pick it up are the ones that are that is that's coming to fruition all of it and that i imagine and not only gratifies you knowing that they have received that but the fact that they received it and appreciated it just as a filmmaker i imagine that's very rewarding you know to have that reaction it is it, i mean look um this was a tough film to make. It, it, uh, it, we certainly knew we were walking a fine line. Part of what um, part of what some critics will not understand about the film, uh, just because you know, is sure. the character of Dan is a white guy, and he goes into an indigenous, a primarily indigenous world. It's a fish out of water story, right? Um, but Dan is a meta character. He is an he is an allegory of modern America. He knows very little when he goes. He goes with a bunch of preconceived notions and he has to unwind what he's seeing and what he's thinking and he gets like he gets educated. He doesn't get like woke in the you know in the sort of modern sure. parlance of the word. But he has a powerful, metaphysical, physical, spiritual, emotional, and personal experience with these people and realizes like how out of touch he's been with this culture. And that just, just seeing some of the early critics write about him, like they, they don't understand. Like the whole point is not that it is an indigenous film. We never claimed we never claim to be indigenous filmmakers. We're not indigenous filmmakers. But what, what the film attempts to do is it attempts to flip the modern cultural narrative and be like, okay, so let's, let's not pretend that we know. Right. That's a first step, right? <laughs> right. Let's, let's be who we are, which is totally unaware people going into this. And we're going to watch it through the eyes of somebody we can relate to as a European white audience. And he's going to have this wild experience. And um, when people let themselves just be with it as a piece of cinema. Um, and, you know, we've been with a bunch of different audiences on the festival circuit. And it is, it's miraculous because we have many different races in the audiences. Um, we've watched it with primarily indigenous people. We've watched it with primarily people of European descent. Everyone, everyone has a healing spiritual experience watching this film. And that's, it's like, that's the whole point. That's what we were right. going for, you know? And that is the, yeah, the movie experience that I think any filmmaker would really want their audience to take away from. On Sacred Ground, premiering on in theaters this Friday the 13th streaming and uh, where can people find out more information if they're just curious about reading up about this a little bit more yeah completely so check out on sacred ground movie.com there uh, there's a resource tab on the on the website as well all the organizations in the resource tab are happening either at Standing Rock or they are Lakota or an indigenous nation that was involved in Standing Rock. And those are organizations you can contribute to directly, not through some you know portal or something, just directly to them. Uh, and of course, there's an active Instagram, Sacred Ground Movie on Sacred Ground Movie and Facebook as well. Josh, thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon to talk with me. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on the movie. Um, it, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to go see it in the, on the big screen because I respect the filmmaking process. So I like to see it the way you intended it on screen. But for sure, absolutely, seeing it at home in the confines of your house, also well accepted too for those who want to do that as well. But thank you, Josh. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Tom. See you at the movies. <laughs>